longtime member of the Urantia Brotherhood and has been a student of the book for 19 years, and he's still just a chap. <laughs> Vern is a Phi Beta Kappa with a university degree in philosophy and a former psychological researcher for the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. He is director of the Spiritual Renaissance Institute and president of the Family of God Foundation, a work dedicated to the proclamation of the spiritual message of the Urantia book worldwide. Vern has been the closing speaker every year at the annual Urantia Brotherhood Summer Conferences. Vern has been the subject of nationwide CBS news interviews, and um, uh, Radio Free Europe has blamed his, has beamed, excuse me. <laughs> Almost ruined that, Vern. <laughs> has beamed his commentary on the future of religion behind the Iron Curtain in six languages. Beginning this fall, Vern's daily radio broadcast, proclaiming the religion of Jesus, the fatherhood of God, and the brotherhood of man, will be heard around the world on over 1,000 stations. All that for his great fame. But I'm going to add just a personal word. I've always thought of, of Vern as a sort of second Paul. In and I think of him taking the um, message to the West with such enthusiasm and newness and freshness that I'm sure he has revived that part of the world and all the rest of it. But Vern, unlike Paul, who seem to have a rather derogatory idea of women, and certainly anti-lib, uh, has chosen for his partner in this endeavor, his dear Nancy, who works side by side with him, and I'm sure is a great inspiration and help to him. And now... Now I am honored to present Vern Venon Paul Grimsley. <laughs> this has been a superb week of renewed acquaintances and spiritual fellowship. Just the other day I was strolling along the shore of Lake Michigan with Tom Kendall, president of the Rancher Foundation. We had to see a little boy pick up a pebble and throw it into the water. And as the concentric ripples spread across the surface, Tom and I ran over and told him we were just going to warn him this time. The next time, Michael 533. <laughs> I was thinking about this. I got a little piece of paper, and I started jotting down page numbers and key concepts and ideas which I wanted to stress. And during the last break, I left my Urantia book and this little piece of paper on my chair. I came back from the break just in time to see Christy wadding up her gum in my little piece of paper. She didn't chew five sticks at a time, they're not going to salvage something. <laughs> I'm not saying that lighting fixture looks like a flying saucer. But I came in early this morning and saw Mo Siegel standing there talking to me. He said, give them my best on you, person. Then he was trying to negotiate bumper sticker space for a red zinger poster. <laughs> Some of you don't know him so well. Mo Siegel had a very distinguished family tree, but he ate it. Mo's a very 
civic-minded man, too. Just yesterday afternoon, he was down at the Red Cross giving a pint of sack. <laughs> One thing which, during the four days of workshop preceding this, and because of my acquaintance with the things that have been going on in the Iranian movement, the tremendous deserving of our support of all the people who are officers and committee people in this Urantia movement is astonishing the amount of work they do. The amount of work these people put in and the dedication oftentimes is unknown by many of us out in the field, and it is tremendous. I want to leave a hand. But this fellowship is wonderful, and for those of you not staying in the dorms, and some of you aren't, there's one thing a little unusual about the situation here. At Kendall College in the dorms, each bathroom is shared by two adjacent rooms with people on, on both sides, which can be odd. This morning I was standing there singing in the shower, and suddenly a voice I didn't recognize started singing along. <laughs> that didn't bother me so much, but then it asked me to turn down the water pressure and pass the soap. <laughs> And I'm not saying the evangelistic enthusiasm of this group is being great, but yesterday afternoon, Peter Sarvati had Nick Scalzo and uh, Helena Sprague and Marjorie Reed out on Michigan Avenue trying to put your rancher books under people's windshield wipes. <laughs> you know, a bad idea, Peter, but try to find cars that are parked first or stopped already. <laughs> but I digress. As Paul said, don't start timing my speech yet, because I haven't started. <laughs> In fact, to reclaim the spirit of what I really want to talk about. May we begin by having a, just a brief moment of silence and wish to seek the Father's will and wisdom for it. The famed architect and innovator, R. Buckminster Fuller, once said that the chief problem with spaceship Earth is that an instruction manual did not come with it. Mr. Fuller, that oversight has been corrected. But this Urantia book is not only a book of planetary information. It is furthermore a book of planetary priorities. It not only tells us a great many truths, it furthermore, interestingly enough, goes on to tell us which ones of those truths are the most important truths, and those points are some of the most fascinating ones in the entire Urantia book to me. Places where it uses the words greatest and most important, things like that. For example, page 29, Midway is right, quote, of all human knowledge, that which is of greatest value, now they're implying much human knowledge has great value, but of all human knowledge, that which is of greatest value, is to know the religious life of Jesus and how he lived it. Planetary priority. Again, page 2086. Midway is right. Greatest truths that mortal man can ever hear. Now, they're implying mortal man is going to hear many truths. But of all these, the greatest truths that mortal man can ever hear are this living gospel of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Close quote. Planetary priority. Or again, page 2052. Quote, that which the world needs most to know, most to know, is men are the sons of God. And through faith, they can actually realize and daily experience this ennobling truth. When I first began reading this Urantia book some 19 years ago, I remember going through and making lists everything the book says needs to be done on this planet. Such projects are enumerated as the multiplication of the number of polylinguists, programs of biological eugenics, safeguarding the home and family, international intercultural exchange and trade. Things such as this are mentioned as of great importance, but hundreds of times, literally by count hundreds of times, they emphasize the need for a spiritual awakening, for a spiritual renaissance in the teachings as we share them, teaching our families, sharing these truths, the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man. That's the number one planetary priority, the spiritual 
awaken. For example, page 909, an archangel of Nebadon writes, and I quote, modern civilization is at a standstill. Use the word standstill in spiritual development and the safeguarding of the home institution. Page 598, the mighty messenger writes, <coughs> quote, the quickest way to realize the brotherhood of man on Urantia is to effect the spiritual transformation of present-day humanity. The only technique for accelerating the natural trend of social evolution is that of applying spiritual pressure from above. On page 2093, the Midwares write, the ultimate goal of society's most advanced achievement can never hope to transcend Jesus' brotherhood of men based on the recognition of the fatherhood of God. On page 910, an archangel writes, spiritual idealism is the energy which really uplifts and advances human culture from one level of attainment to another. On 1041, an Melchizedek writes, quote, the hour is striking. We're presenting to Buddhism, to Christianity, to Hinduism, even to the peoples of all faiths, not the gospel about Jesus, but the living spiritual reality of the gospel of Jesus. Page 2082, the Midwayers write, a new and fuller revelation of the religion of Jesus is destined to conquer an empire of materialistic secularism and to overthrow a world sway of mechanistic naturalism. Urantia is now quivering on the very brink of one of its most amazing and enthralling epochs of social readjustment, moral quickening, and spiritual enlightenment. Again, page 2082, religion does need new leaders, spiritual men and women, who will dare to depend solely on Jesus and his teachings. If Christianity, they write, if Christianity persists in neglecting its spiritual mission, while it continues to busy itself with social and material problems, the spiritual renaissance must await the coming of these new teachers of Jesus' religion who will be exclusively devoted to the spiritual regeneration of men. And again, Melchizedek writes on 1041, all Urantia is waiting for the proclamation of the ennobling message of Michael, unencumbered by the accumulated doctrines and dogmas of 19 centuries of contact with the religions of evolutionary origin. The spirit of truth, for what purpose was it given? Listen to what the Midwayers say on 2063. This spirit was bestowed for the purpose of qualifying believers more effectively to preach the gospel of the kingdom, to share. This has many connotations, teaching the family, discussing it with husbands and wives. But the sharing, knowledge we read in Marancha Moda is possessed only by sharing. What is this gospel? Jesus talks about it. When Jesus and the apostles were encamped at Magadan, they trained 70 evangelists to preach throughout Galilee, Samaria, and Judea. And on page 1806, they're described as enthusiasts for this gospel of the kingdom. On 1598, Jesus says, simply go forth proclaiming, this is the kingdom of heaven. What's the message? This is the kingdom of heaven. God is your father, and you are his sons, and this good news, if you wholeheartedly believe it, is your eternal salvation. On 1805, he says, proclaim the spiritual brotherhood of the sons of God. On 1931, listen to the strength of what he calls people to be and do. He says on 1931, you are to be valiant in defense of righteousness, mighty in the promulgation of truth, and aggressive in the preaching of this gospel of the kingdom even to the ends of the earth. Again and again these themes. He emphasized this so strongly to the apostles, the sharing, that he once even says, this is the command for them. In 2049 he says, if you would obey me, he says to them, go into the lands of the Gentiles, preach this gospel, he said, there is but one law to obey. This is quoting the book, Jesus. There is but one law to obey, and that is the command to go forth, proclaiming this gospel of the kingdom. So he was emphasizing the task of the sharing of that spiritual truth. On 1930, Jesus and the apostles are encamped near Gethsemane, and looking to the future, he says, the persistent preaching of this gospel of the kingdom will one day bring to all nations a new and unbelievable liberation, intellectual freedom, and religious liberty. 
On 2043, he says, as the Father sent me into the world, so send I you. Of course, just reading that in the book, just thinking about some of these commissions, is clearly not enough. Just reading your ranch book will not guarantee that one will achieve spiritual commitment any more than reading the Guinness Book of World Records to guarantee that you'll set a world record. <coughs> Between reading a great cookbook and becoming a great cook, Lies a long path, strewn with burnt roast, lopsided cakes, <laughs> sagging soufflés, and catastrophic casserole. <laughs> and between the reading of the Rancher book, clearly, and the being and doing of these things, lies a long path of spiritual decision making. It's interesting, Jesus also presents the idea, very relevant to the Rancher movement. And this is on 1474, where he's talking to the miller on one of his trips, he says, grind the grain of truth, grind that hard grain of truth so that people will be able to assimilate it. Many of us have had experiences of trying to interest people in a three pound, 2,097 page book, and sometimes they're not so interested in that, but they are hungering for these spiritual things. And if we've found these, Jesus also says, if you would lead others into the kingdom, you yourself must walk in the clear light of living truth. That's 1571. But that the first challenge is for us really, really to know God, really to be filled with this love, this spiritual joy, then we can share it <coughs> with gladness to a seeking and questing planet. It's 1975, and the book was published in 1955. 20 years. The first 20 years of Jesus' life were likewise relatively uneventful. Eventful, but relative. <laughs> and the first 20 years of the Urantia movement have been, in many senses, non-spectacular. But there are challenges of immense order and nature before us, which will call from us all our love, all our spiritual commitment. Consider that spiritual commitment for a moment. There's a part of the book I try to read several times every year, because it's an intriguing one, because it presents an image, a model of spiritual commitment, unlike any, anywhere else, I think, in the book, at least for our lifetimes on this planet. On 1257, they're writing about the planetary reserve core of destiny, and this is one of the most fascinating things in the entire book. These are mortals on this earth, numbering about a thousand at the time of the writing of the book, they say, who have some special assignments, and they give some of the qualifications. Now, that's what's interesting. On 1257, they say that to be a reservist, it is necessary to possess, and I quote, one of these qualifications is, quote, wholehearted dedication to some special social, economic, political, spiritual, or other cause coupled with willingness to serve without human recognition or reward. I wonder how many people would or will fall by the wayside in those criteria as we think about them. Any one of us can measure ourselves by this. Wholehearted dedication to the Father's will. Ah, but not ending there even. And willingness to do the work, not concerned about who gets the credit so much as getting the work done. Willingness to do it without human recognition or reward. Now, that's one of those standards. Consider another outstanding example of this kind of spiritual commitment in our planetary past. This is Amador, a figure who's always intrigued me. He's described in the Arantia book as the outstanding human hero of this Lucifer rebellion. Now, Amador was a child of the dust like us. But when rebellion came, he stood side by side with Van in commitment. And it's intriguing, there's one place in the book on 762 where they say that for seven long years during that rebellion, for seven long years, the first question asked throughout all the universe, all the way from Edentia to Salvington, clear to you versus the first question was, what of Amadon of Eurasia? Does he still stand unmoved? 
The universe was watching. And I thought, little would this child of dust, this animal origin creature, have dreamed that the very broadcast circuits of the universe were crackling forth his name from star to star. They were talking about it. What an Amazon of your engine. Does he still stand unmoved? And I think now of the fact that on this planet Urantia, this world of our universe sovereign's final incarnation, now the fifth ethical revelation has been given to us. And I believe the universe is likewise watching us. And there may well be those who ask of you and ask of me, what of you and what of me do we still stand unmoved? true to the Father's purposes, committed totally to the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, to the spiritual path, above all to seeking, finding, and doing the living will of the living God. The universe is watching. I'm convinced. There are so many tasks outlined in this book, clearly stated things that need to be done. I remember reading a history book that when General George McClellan was one of Lincoln's generals. In fact, he was in charge of the Union Army in the first part of the Civil War. General McClellan was so indecisive, he was so kind of confused and overly cautious that finally, in utter exasperation, Abraham Lincoln sent him a telegram which read, My dear General McClellan, if you do not intend to use the Army, I should like to borrow it. <laughs> Speaking now to the youth among us, very young. Speaking now to those of us who feel that we have the majority part of our life yet to live in service of this movement. <laughs> Have I got out yet? <laughs> Why are your teeth when I need them? <laughs> There are so many tasks outlined in this book that need to be done, things that we're called to do that I believe if we don't do them, there will come to be another generation who will and who will ask of us and wonder of us what on earth it was that we thought we were doing. Because we're challenged to set about some things. Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote, God grants to every mind its choice between truth and repose. We in this hall have chosen truth. Let us forever relinquish our wistful wishing for repose. We shall not be granted it. But we are called and challenged to serve. Now, somebody may say, but, but the Eurasian movement, well, we're going to depend on our leaders for that. The thing I think is of tremendous importance to realize, you are the Eurasian movement. This is it. What you see is what you get. <laughs> what you are is what you get. The Urantia movement, as some of us are astonished to discover, is not <coughs> composed of people who are nine feet tall and will purple in the dark. <laughs> the flesh and blood mortal human beings, sons and daughters of the Father, seeking to find and do our Father's will. And this tremendous enterprise and the things which are called forth from us and the kind of lives we're challenged to live and the kind of inspiration we're challenged to be to this planet. Some people will say, well, I can never do anything for this movement. I can never be of any importance. I can never be a significant factor in this range. That's like blowing out your candle to see how dark it is. <laughs> we're called <laughs> we're called and challenged to vital faith Jesus said you are the salt of the earth the salt of the earth one little boy in class was asked for a definition of salt he said salt is the stuff that makes your eggs taste bad if you don't put any on <laughs> Jesus was saying that we are to live lives of zest and savor and to impart that kind of zest and savor to the rest of the planet. That we have a living, joyous, effervescent, bubbling, kinetic, dynamic religion because we've found God and we're certain about this and we've been invigorated spiritually and we can march out and change this world. Of this I am convinced. 
We have a living religion. There was a great school teacher one time took her class on a field trip to a museum of natural history. Stuffed wild animals all over the place. The boy came home and his mother asked him, what did you do in school today? And the teacher took us to see a dead circus. <laughs> changing the world and things like that. There have always been skeptics and pessimists. There always will be. There was years ago an old mountain man who had never seen a train before. He came down into the valley and there on the tracks there was a train and they were shoveling the coal into it. And this mountain man looked down a little bit and he said, well, they'll never get it to go. But they kept shoveling in the coal and they did get it to go and as it began picking up a little speed, picking up a little steam, he said with his mouth open, they'll never get it to stop. <laughs> very hungry. The specters of famine and starvation are real on many parts of this globe. But I believe if that boy, that prodigal son, when he became very hungry, began to realize that material things were not enough, and he turned and came back to his father, I believe this prodigal planet Urantia is going to become fed up with its endless vain quest of materialism and turn to the father of all. And this prodigal planet Urantia is going to see a spiritual renaissance upon it that's going to change this planet. All men are brothers, all men are one, all men are his, and we are called to work to bring that day to be. As the father sent me into the world, said Jesus, so send I you. Woo. 